colleagues, thank you very much for this opportunity at such an important time in our collective history. This is an ideal time to reflect on where we're at and how we go forward. It's also significant for me in that I'm going to be returning to a model I first used at this very institution when we were really concerned about holistic student support using effective and feasible technologies. Secondly, I've been really privileged to participate in a number of COVID era reflective opportunities over the past year. So I'm going to be sharing some of the findings from several different sources and together we're going to reflect on these. Last week, the Higher Education Leadership and Management Programs hosted a webinar highlighting the particular challenges in our African context. Now, as you all know, we've just come through the third wave, and a fourth wave is anticipated for the end of November and early December. Now, Professor Abdul Karim poignantly quoted the Pope on rethinking our priorities. Let's just think about those priorities and our dreams. Our priority in higher education is to enable access to and facilitate success in learning that empowers our graduates to legitimately participate in the world. One dream for many is the magic solution that technology is going to be in terms of improving the access success relationship. In the early stages of the pandemic and the overnight transition to emergency remote teaching, ERT, great many claims were made that COVID-19 is driving a long overdue revolution in education, that educators have at last been forced into the 21st century, and that finally we're embracing the benefits of technology-based education. Now, this is not new to UNISA. The institution has been integrating technology-supported learning for years now. And what you as an institution know is what the first national survey on the impact of COVID on education told us. Firstly, this pandemic has highlighted major issues around equity and inequality, with a key threat being to the issue of digital fluency. Now, secondly, with so much focus on student learning during these times, what about staff? What about us? management, academics, and support staff. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you an overview of findings from different research projects on the impact of emergency remote teaching on both students and staff that may enable us to talk about the way forward. Now, although much of these data are from the engineering education context, I believe that they do indeed speak to higher education more generally. I'm taking the conceptual position described as Ubuntu Kurere, where curricula, that's everything we do in this space, can be thought of as an active conceptual tool that is dialectical, inclusive, and democratic, enabling varied voices. I'm going to share with you a range of voices that may speak to the nature of and implications around the question of access. So I'm drawing together some of the findings from three different research projects all under the umbrella of an engineering education impact ev evaluation initiative. Now in September last year with so much focus on student learning during ERT, the South African Society for Engineering Education was concerned about how engineering educators and postgrads were coping with the transition to online learning. We circulated a national survey looking at working environments, forms of communication, perceptions of challenges and successes. In March this year, we followed up with a faculty-wide survey at Stellenbosch University, where I work in the engineering faculty, a survey of our undergraduate and postgrad students. Now, all these projects are framed with a, a holistic theoretical model in order to develop the whole person and fulfill higher education's mandate to inculcate knowledge, citizenship and skills, our cognitive, affective and psychomotor educational objectives should be aligned to epistemological, 
ontological and praxis curriculum dimensions, access to which requires educators to provide cognitive, affective, and systemic support. Now, this framework has evolved for the simple reason that STEM educators often justifiably complain that social scientists all say the same thing with different words. Now, this model is exactly what Prof. Paquet was talking about yesterday, what you referred to as the thinking, doing, and being of what it is that we do. So this model is our analytical instrument, and we refer to it as the CAS model in short. So for the purpose of analyzing the impact of pandemic conditions on higher education, we're looking specifically at the cognitive, affective, and systemic support factors that either contribute to or constrain access. So by way of example as to how we use the analytical tool, I'm going to start with the national survey. So here, for example, we categorized the different kinds of responses we received according to the dimensions. Cognitive dimension is the discipline in which the participants work. The affective is their specific role, lecturer, management or other. The systemic is their place in our South African higher education tertiary system. Now, when we asked about changes to their working environment, we pulled the common references and then analyzed the qualitative responses. We had over 20,000 words in response to the survey. And we analyzed these according to whether or not the focus was on the cognitive or affective or systemic support elements. Now on the positive side, in terms of the question as to the changes in the environment, we do see evidence of some of the benefits of this shift to emergency remote teaching. Staff rethinking how they support cognitive access, making concept videos, a shift to project-based learning. In the affective space, staff have become more aware of their student situations. And of course, all the arrangements to supply data and devices was a welcome form of systemic support, as all our speakers have referred to yesterday. Now, however, not everybody has been so fortunate. Access to your own space for work and study is a luxury. Access to the digital tools, appropriate equipment, and the skills to use them have become seriously problematic. Similarly, with what forms of communication participants used, we see the entire gamut of platforms and applications. Now, the analysis of the qualitative responses revealed a host of innovative approaches and feedback on what worked and didn't work. Many staff speak about innovative communication strategies. And in fact, some forms of teaching have even been more appropriate in the online space. However, across the board, as Eunice knows all too well, student engagement via online forums has been really problematic. Perhaps we have underestimated how much we read off each other when we are actually in physical contact as this particular lecturer described. Now, it is worth noting that participants reported way more challenges than successes, but that common to both is the whole issue of time. On the one hand, workload and time, but on the other, staff report having had more time with family, time to reflect and innovate. Now, with the major focus being the workload implied in repurposing activities and the systemic elements around managing the whole situation, all of this has resulted in exhausted, burnt out staff. One respondent captured it as this. Work life and home life have become one in a very unhealthy way. Research has evaporated as all available time is devoted to the undergraduate teaching project and the associated admin. 14 hour work days are common. Dominant feedback on successes, however, has been around quality time with family. Like the parent who got time to see their newborn son develop, 
There are also a few success stories demonstrating this synergistic relationship between the cognitive, the affective, and the systemic. I'm proud of how my classes went. Very positive feedback from students about how much they learned thanks to the structured lecturing, regular assessments, and how supported they felt. Then we see on the systemic side, a shift to context responsiveness, using simple tools and deliberately not overwhelming students. Now let's take a look at the student data. The key systemic themes that the students talk of, and now we're talking about over 4,000 students, mirror those of the staff surveys, with the major, issue, major issues being information overload and confusion, communication inconsistency, and inadequate feedback. When we don't have or can't use the very tools that are meant to enable cognitive access, learning itself becomes constrained. Students talk of not having time to grasp concepts. Now we know the engineering workload is really high, but when coupled with the systemic challenges, like finding things and structuring time, the impact on longer term access to concepts and approaches to solving our serious national and global challenges is dire. And the impact of these stresses is felt affectively with previously unheard of levels of stress, anxiety and burnout. Now, what is interesting from our qualitative postgraduate survey is those students and staff who report higher levels of productivity had access to affective support, supportive parents, peers, supervisors, a supportive environment, their own space. But not everybody is so fortunate. And in many cases, staff indicate not feeling supported by management. As well-intentioned as all the educational support people were, and I'm one of them, many experienced these initiatives as utterly overwhelming. However, this also sensitized staff to how their students were feeling. Here is a letter that describes the reality experienced by one particular staff member. Now, I'd like to draw this all together by pointing out the effects of ignoring the affective dimension. In one of the Helm studies, we see staff, and in our case students, speak of academic guilt and diminishing self-esteem. Many staff, and again students, speak of negative emotional experiences related to self-worth social comparisons, fear of judgment, peer pressure. These effects are stark when it comes to social justice. If education is intended to empower, to transform our society, then we need to understand not only the relationship between the cognitive, affective and systemic support dimensions. We need to understand that if our mandate is to enable access to forms of knowledge and their associated practices so as to transform our society, we need to recognize the impact of the systemic and the affective on that cognitive access. This is like a three-legged stool. A stool with two legs cannot stand. 
Now, our ultimate mandate is to enable cognitive access through this synergistic relationship between the affective and systemic support domains and elements in our curricula, in how we are in the higher education space. When it comes to digital fluency development, a major challenge we face is the rapid evolution of technologies and the serious infrastructural and resource constraints we have on this continent. A one hour Teams meeting can take anything from one to two and a half gigs per hour. So as well intentioned as the 20 or 30 gig stipend has been, it's not sufficient. Now, when it comes to the care ethic, the whole question of how do we show that we care? Hypermanagerialism in some institutions has led staff to question their role in the system, to question their very own futures. My, third, my final critical question is, so what's going to differentiate UNISA, for example, or other open distance learning institutions if all institutions start moving into this online space. What we do know is that we need to be listening to the varied voices. What we do needs to be responsive and holistic, and that is going to take significant capacity building. Practically, this means we must realistically enable the digital fluency development of our staff and our students, knowing full well that we are severely limited in the face of exponential technological evolution and resources on the continent. Many of our staff success stories come from those who kept it simple. Those who liaised with student representatives, listened to their students. They used the platforms or forms of communication negotiated with those very students. We need to think about this issue of care. In our faculty, for example, management have proactively started to address affective support for both staff and students, given the significant increase in emotional and mental health challenges that we've seen. And finally, we need to remember what Dr. Jansen said yesterday. Our humanity is at the very heart of what we do.